So meanwhile, we're continuing in our series on identity in Christ. Last week, we looked at what it means to be, have an identity of being those who have been created, specifically designed and called into being by God and claimed by Him for a relationship. Today, we're going to look at what it means that we are hopelessly fallen, mortally wounded, unable on our own to sustain that relationship. So let's pray. Thank you, gracious Lord, for calling us here today. We give you thanks that we're gathered in this house. We ask that even now you'd send your Holy Spirit upon the reading and preaching of your word, upon the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup, that we might be joined more and more to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So from Psalm 51, this is David's prayer after the prophet Nathan exposed the fact that David had taken another man's wife and then had the husband killed Convicted to his core, he cried out, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words, blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. But purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities." This is the word of the Lord. Well, this past week we have been mourning the passing of Billy Graham, known to many as America's pastor. Billy Graham has literally reached millions through his crusades and his message, his simple message of the need for a Savior and that Savior being Jesus Christ. Billy preached once in Baton Rouge and Tiger Stadium, and we are still feeling the ripple effects of that as out of that came the chapel of the campus, and many, many who were in this room were touched by Billy's preaching. He's one of the most effective preachers of all time. But I want to tell you about the historic time that Billy Graham preached a sermon and did not give an invitation. I know because I was there. I was crushed. Let me tell you what happened. The backdrop was... When we grew up, we would listen. If Billy Graham came on television, one of his crusades, my family would gather on the couch and watch. We sat together. And with so few networks back then, if Billy Graham took over one of the networks, there wasn't that much else to watch. So there I was. We were watching Billy Graham, and Billy convicted me of sin. I was 11 years old. That was his kind of preaching. And As always in his sermons, he would begin with talking about the need that we have for Christ, talking about some of the ills in society or the brokenness in the world. And as he talked about the upheaval that was in the nation at that time, he mentioned the numerous things that were going wrong, including sexual sin. Now, I had been playing spin the bottle with Marianne Swanko. And I just had this feeling that maybe I was the one Billy was talking about. (laughs) It was horrifying. Suddenly, I felt this incredible separation between me and God. I was convicted. Something's the matter with me. I'm not right with God. I listened intently to the end of his message. And at the end, as he gave the invitation, I turned to my mom and asked her, how do you know if you've really accepted Christ as your Savior? Now, my mom, one of the greatest things was she always thought I was fine and never needed to change. So she said very lovingly, but completely unhelpfully, don't worry about it. You'll just know. But I did worry about it. I wanted to know. How do I get reconnected to God? I know there's something the matter with me. Well, that began a a two-and-a-half-year search and quest for how a guy longing for God could get connected to him. The next year in my church, we had confirmation class. And I thought, this will be good. I'm going to learn now what I don't know, and this will lead me to know Christ. But we were between ministers at the time, and the minister we had was an interim pastor who, to me, my 11-year-old eyes, 12-year-old eyes, looked like he was at least 105. 
he was sweet, but he could hardly get to the chair or find his place in the Bible. There was, I just got nothing. Well, after the confirmation class, the elders would meet with each confirmation student before they could join the church. And I knew I was going to be found out. But I was also anticipating it. This moment would be a moment of shame for our family. After all, my dad was an elder. They would ask me, do you know Christ? And I would say, I don't. That would be terrible. But then I would say, but tell me, and they would lead me to get connected to God. So the time came, we broke up into rooms, and an elder, again, not a young elder, took me back to a room, slapped me on the shoulder and said, son, it's so good when young people are interested in church. No, I thought, I'm not interested in church. I want to know God. How do I know God? Nothing. Another year passed. It was in eighth grade, and I read that Billy Graham was coming to the Miami Marine Stadium to preach the sunrise service. My sweet dad agreed to get up before the crack of dawn and drive the half an hour through the city over to Key Biscayne where the stadium was. It was a beautiful morning. The sun was rising over Biscayne Bay. The choir was singing. Billy got up and preached. He preached that Jesus is risen. I thought, here it comes. I'm ready. Call me to Christ. Billy sat down. He just sat down. It's like, what? I want to come just as I am. <laughs> But nothing. I don't know if the organizers told him not to do it or what. Maybe it's the only time he didn't give an invitation. But that would take another three and a half months of pretty intense spiritual questing before, thanks to some kids in my youth group and a camp counselor that gave an invitation, I would get connected to Christ. Now, upon further review, what I thought was such a heinous sin with Mary, Mary Ann Swanko I'm not sure it was even a transgression, but it was symptomatic. It was a reveal of what's actually going on in every human heart. We know we're created for God. We know we're meant for a relationship with Him. We know we're not connected. We know there's something wrong with everything in the world, and that something wrong rises out of my own heart. I'm separated. I become conscious of that sin, and it creates in us a longing a pining for connection to know how do I get over this sense that I'm just not right. Well, this past week, if you were reading in your Lenten guide, we had as the theme image this painting by Masaccio, an Italian painter in 1427, way ahead of his time. Masaccio has captured the moment in Genesis 3 between the time when Adam and Eve were caught having taken the forbidden fruit and before they began their new life. This is the moment, it's called the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. When the Lord said, you have sinned, now you must leave paradise. You must leave Eden and go into the world and make your way through the sweat of your brow and the pain of your childbirth and the reality of death having entered the world. You look closely at these faces. Up until this time in Western art, almost all painting was symbolic. The faces were always painted expressionless, and you got the meaning of the painting by the symbols around it. But these faces aren't expressionless, are they? They're deeply wounded and pained. And Masaccio is reminding us of something. Sin is not committed by lovable rogues who are getting away with something under the nose of a persnickety assistant principal who simply wants to enforce meaningless laws anyway. That's the way so many times we think about God. He doesn't want me to have fun, and sin is just getting away with what I want to do anyway. Masaccio reminds us that the face of sin is deep woundedness. Have you ever seen these faces on people? I've seen them. I've seen this gesture of Adam, the moment a man comes awake to the wreckage he's created in his family. I have seen this very face of Eve in Louisville, Kentucky, early one morning when I saw a young woman on her way into an abortion clinic. These faces appeared on the parents in Parkland, Florida, when that horrifying coalition 
of sin and rejection and violence and opportunity created such a senseless shooting. I've known these gestures, these faces, though often masked inside the hearts of a child when she hears her parents are getting divorced. I've known these faces when the Ponzi scheme is exposed, when the last dollar has been gambled away, when you wake up in the drunk tank, when you realize that the final moment was missed because it was pride, only pride, that kept you from going in a timely fashion and now it's too late. When you realize that now that you've said it, now that you've done it, there's no turning back and nothing ever will be the same. This is families exploded by loss, sudden and searing. This is the face of the understanding that we are hopelessly fallen and mortally wounded. Sin is not about being naughty before a persnickety rule keeper. It is about being deeply and heart-rendingly broken because we are disconnected from what matters most to us. Can you imagine these two that you're watching on their way out of the garden crying out, no, please, no, have mercy. Can't you do something about this? We're sorry it was our fault. We were wrong. Please, please fix this. Consciousness of sin, like Billy Graham awoken, awakened in me, leads to an awareness of the consequence of sin, that it's not about little stuff, it's about deep in the heart disconnection, which leads to the crying out for mercy for our sins. That's the moment David reached in Psalm 51. He had stayed home when kings go out to war. He had seen Bathsheba and determined to take her for himself. And then he realized to get rid of the problem that was her husband, he moved him to the front lines of battle so he would be killed. And then he thought he would get away with it. Except that Bathsheba was pregnant. And the prophet Nathan had a word of the Lord and spoke to David that night and said, You are the man. And it all blew up in David's face. And then he wrote Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Don't expel me like our first parents from the Garden of Eden. Create a new heart in me. This is the bottom line response of coming to the awareness of our identity as those who have been created to know and love God and to realize that we, each one of us, repeat the choice of our first parents and say, no, not your way, but my way, and reap the heartbreaking consequences. We cry out in need of this mercy. That's not an easy word to accept. I would rather have a resume to present by which I can say, Lord of all people, you should be pleased with me. I would rather enter a posture where I say, well, I may be bad, but at least I'm not like those. So if you're going to take any, you should at least include me. But the problem with failing to truth tell about the brokenness of sin in the human heart is that it means we're living our lives built on an illusion. I don't know how strongly or how better to communicate this except to tell you it's so incredibly important. If we do not reckon with our identity as sinful, estranged people, we cannot build a foundation that lasts for our lives. Everything we do will be built on the house of cards that is the illusion of our own worthiness or the dismissal of others in contempt. Any system that doesn't reckon with the fact that there's something wrong with everything, beginning with my heart, cannot sustain the reality of human existence. It can't. Let me see if I can explain. If I don't own my sin, 
then I have to project something that covers up the deep loneliness and wound in my heart. I've got to pretend that I am worthy, and I might spend a lot of effort going to that education, work achievements, accumulation of power, accumulation of money, accumulation of the beautiful family, appearances before others. It's exhausting to keep up the shell game that I have it all connected with God in my own strength and that I could survive any spotlight he might turn in on me. In fact, it generally leads to needing to push off against others, to stand away and say, well, at least I'm not that. At least I work for a living. At least I stayed home with my family. At least I go to church. At least I talk about God. At least I do good things in the community, and I'm not like them. It's a house of cards. It's totally isolating. Jesus knew that. He told a parable based on Psalm 51 in David's prayer in Luke 18 that those who trusted in their own righteousness might no longer do so. He said there were two guys, a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, before Jesus, Pharisees were, these were the white hats, the good guys. These were the ones who were religious, who were socially acceptable, who were seeking God's kingdom, who were following the law. They were the kind of people you would like to be with. The tax collectors were the despicable ones, the cheats, the betrayers, the socially unacceptable, the dirty, the, the compromised. Two guys, says Jesus, they both wanted to pray. One went and stood away from other people, and he looked up to heaven and he said, Oh God, I thank you, not for your mercies, but that I am not like other people. Thank you that I'm not an extortioner, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a deceiver. I'm not even like that tax collector. After all, I tithe. I go to church. I do good works. There he stood in the isolation of his pretend goodness. While the tax collector wouldn't even stand near the other people or look up to heaven, but instead beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That one, I tell you, said Jesus, went home justified. For everyone who exalts himself like this Pharisee will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself like this tax collector will be exalted. He flipped everything on its head. Now, the brilliance of Jesus is that he tells this story as something that happened once upon a time. Two guys went up to pray, but then he flips it on his audience and says, and right now, in the present moment, Continuingly, the one who exalts himself is going to be humbled, but the one who is continuously realizing sinfulness, brokenness, and neediness, that one will be exalted. It's not one and done with Jesus. I got it all taken care of at Billy Graham. I'm fine. No. It's moment by moment keeping the line in to the reality that I am broken, that I am estranged from God reliant solely on His present, continuing mercy. This past week, I invited you all to say the Jesus Prayer during your readings. The Jesus Prayer is based on Luke 18 and this parable, which is also based on Psalm 51. It's thoroughly scriptural, but it's written in such a beautiful rhythm. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's what the spiritual gurus call a breath prayer. It me moves in the cadence of breathing. Lord Jesus Christ, breathe. Son of God, breathe. Have mercy on me, breathe, a sinner. It's meant to speak who Jesus is. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and who I am, a sinner, and then to pray that the two would be brought together. Have mercy on me. It's meant to acknowledge the reality of my sin and the reality of God's holiness and mercifulness and bring them together. The Jesus prayer creates a channel down into my heart, bypassing the oh-so-tedious and boring list of all the reasons why I'm acceptable. Don't you get sick of that list? Oh, endless self-justification. 
It's gag-worthy. The Jesus prayer bypasses all of that and sends a line straight into my heart where I know that I am not right and need a Savior. And it sends a channel up into the heart of God, bypassing the endlessly tedious caricature that God is some persnickety rule keeper just waiting to smite sinners for minor infractions. That's ridiculous. It sends a channel to the heart of God whose mercies are new every morning. And opening that channel, it cries out, Lord Jesus Christ, merciful one, have mercy on me, a sinner. It is the connecting prayer. I urged you to say this prayer aloud 10 times. A lot of you did it. And so that's powerful. Yes, it is. It's not the way Presbyterians usually pray, but it's super powerful. You can say it at night in the small hours. You can get in a rhythm of repeating it while walking. But the key is to lose self-consciousness and tumble into the reality of the merciful God and the sinful human being who are brought together as we cry out for God to have mercy. Next week, I'm going to try to explain to you why this works, how it is that our God loves us so much that He identified fully with us in our condition as sinners in order to switch identities and give us His identity as Son of God and Righteous One. We're going to delve deeply into that mystery, and I, I don't know how to more strongly urge you, don't not read this week. Don't not go to your small group. Don't not come to church. It is the most important thing I could tell you. But in the meantime, let's close with a phrase that's been made famous around the world for the way it brings together these dual identities we have as being created and also sinful and how that comes into our lives with God. The truth is, at the very same time, you and I are more sinful than we can ever know, and at the same time, more loved than we can ever imagine. Beloved, sail straight into your identity as sinners claimed by God. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. We thank you that you are absolutely rigorous in your evaluation of us because you have something so much more to offer us than our resumes. Come and speak to us your mercy. May you be known as the bread is broken and the cup is shared. Amen.